Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for the word that you purpose to speak to us by your Spirit. And Father, what a blessing it is to have your Spirit of wisdom and revelation active in and among us this morning. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us by your Spirit. And Father, we, we purpose not to be forgetful hearers. We don't want to be those who just simply have heard and found it interesting or entertaining, but we want to be those who receive the words that you speak to us as commands and purpose to be doers of that word. In Jesus' name, amen. In Psalm 1, I'm going to read these six verses of Psalm 1, beginning at verse 1, where it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall, shall stand, excuse me, shall, <laughs> therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, and, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now this is a, a great way for the book of Psalms to begin. It's a, it's a great door and entrance into the Psalms. But uh, we started last week to, to entertain this, this thought of annual versus perennial. And uh, we were talking about the, the, the relationship of the two of them, right? It's, it's certainly this week, if, if you hadn't begun to think about spring by last week, you've started by this week, right? Certainly there's been stuff happening out here in the world around us to get our attention and make us start to think of spring. And whether that causes you to think of actual gardening, like you want to go do some, or whether it just causes you to think of how pleasant it is to look at other people's work when they've been gardening. <laughs> we, uh, we begin to think of these things, right? Yes. We've had a, a bunch of daffodils on the dining room table this week. I'm not sure where they came from. Somebody brought them into the house who wasn't me. Yeah, I have a guess, but uh, I'm <laughs> but uh, we got daffodils on on the table. Well, you know that's 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 just not fair when when it's cold outside. <laughs> Put daffodils on the table, but it's got me thinking. I'm moving in that direction. I'm almost ready to move past daffodils and on to tulips. It's <laughs> the moment is coming. Are you still here? Yeah. But. <clears throat> We start to think of these things. And the question, which uh, is a spiritual question, is, are we going to be annual or perennial? Now, I defined these terms last week. Annual, when we're talking about plants, is, is a noun, the, a plant that lives for one growing season. It just does its thing continuously, and then it's done. And that may not sound like a bad thing in a spiritual sense, except that what causes it to expire is not that it's run its course and finished its race, but that it's encountered some kind of hardship or difficulty. Perennials are those which persevere through those hardships and difficulties. Perennial as an adjective meaning lasting for an indefinitely long time, enduring, and when we're saying it of plants, it means having a life cycle lasting more than two years. A perennial plant, right? So uh, we're talking about Plants which persevere through the difficulties that come. Now in the scriptures, the picture that we're given, particularly in the book of Psalms, but all through the scriptures, of uh, what is what we're going to compare to annual. Now don't, uh, the botanists in the group don't need to come and try to correct me later. I understand that not every plant we're going to mention is actually an annual or a, you know, or a perennial. Uh, I mean, they're all one or the other, but they're not all the one in the category where, yeah, I got it. But if we're going to understand annual as temporary and, and short-lived and not resisting with great strength, then grass becomes the example that we encounter over and over and over again in the Scripture as the, the metaphor for that which is short-lived, which becomes dry, which is for the fire and for the cutting, Right? And that, that's our, our, our annual. The perennial, the, 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 the metaphor that we keep running across in the scriptures is the tree. The tree which perseveres season after season, growing tall and strong and doing its, its work, right? 
continuing to bring forth fruit. Now, where are we at? Oh, you're a couple of steps ahead of me. That's okay. Fear not. Are we, now, we're, now we're back. Okay, so there's the tree. You got a tree? I need eyes in the back of my head. That would help here. Or maybe I need a 42-inch monitor right here. No. All right. So, but uh, the, the thing about the grass is that it's temporary. It's grass and it's temporary. And even if you dress it up, It can be attractive grass, it can be aggressive grass, it can, it, can, it can seem like it's doing big things grass, but it's temporary. Its season comes and goes. It will brown and, and it'll be for the fire or for the cutting, right? But when adversity comes, when hardship comes, if we got, yeah, that's adversity, right? Where plants are concerned, that's adversity. Now, in, in your life, in my life, adversity looks a little different than that sometimes. But for a plant, that's adversity right there. When adversity comes, the things which are temporary end. But the things which are built to last stay. And we are built to last. We are, spiritually speaking, built to last. We have been called not to be a flash in the pan that fades under the first bit of pressure, but to be those who put down roots and persevere, who stand in whatever comes and persevere. And when we're done persevering on the earth, we get to be in eternity, steadfast and eternal, right? And so the tree becomes a wonderful picture of steadfast and eternal, right? The planting of the Lord. And let's scoot ahead to my last one. Bingo. Here we have multi-generational worship. We've got the whole forest praising the Lord who made them. Right? And they're there together because that, that represents to me the fruitfulness of a tree throughout its existence. You see, a tree continues to produce, and even a rather tired tree will continue to produce. Uh, I spent a part of my life living in what was sort of a retired apple orchard. It had been an orchard on a farm, and then the orchard quit being used as an orchard, and they started to build houses in it, but many of the apple trees remained. And these were intensely old apple trees, and uh, much older than what you typically see in any orchard. Great big trunks, and in uh, many cases in poor condition. They'd not been maintained like an orchard would be, and, and uh, they, they were uh, very hollow, many of them, and uh, full of really good potting soil. It was just rotten, nasty stuff living inside of them and all of this. But they continued, the, the apples, the blooms were always there because even, even a tree which is having a tough life is continuing to bear its fruit. Not in every season, but we keep coming back around to fruit season. And you may have seasons where you've got to draw in a little bit in order to survive, but you will come back around to fruit bearing season. Your fruit bearing is not behind you. Because when you're perennial, you just keep coming and keep bringing the fruit. Amen? All right, so in, uh, in Psalm chapter 1, he says... Blessed is the man that walketh. Now we're talking about somebody who's blessed, a blessed person. And actually in a peculiar turn of events, the word blessed or blessing or however you would prefer to translate it sometimes comes across as praises or praiseworthy. It's plural. What is it doing plural? I don't know what it's doing plural, but that's pointing. Uh, Hebrew scholars tend to tell us that it has something to do with the, 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 the fruitfulness of this individual, that there is praises, blessings on this person. When we make these choices, it does something good for us. Amen. When we make these choices, it does something good for us. Now, um, I want to deal with the, the ungodly first. At verse 4, he says, The ungodly are not so. Not so how? Well, as we just described, the godly in these first three verses, perhaps you remember from a few moments ago when we were reading them, that's a pretty good description. Would you, would you like to be? Does Psalm 1, 1 through 3 sound like what you would like to say about yourself? Yes. Yes. That wouldn't be a bad epitaph to have, would it? That this is a description of you, the life that you've lived. You walked not in the counsel of the ungodly. You didn't stand in the way of sinners. You didn't sit in the seat of the scornful. Your delight was in the law of the Lord. 
And, and in his law you meditated day and night. You were like a tree planted by rivers of water, bringing forth your fruit in your season. Your leaf didn't wither, and whatever you did prospered. That would be a wonderful thing to have said about you at the end of this, wouldn't it? But the ungodly are not so. They're not like that. They're different. They have a difference. They are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Now, the chaff is, is a picture in, in grain crops that we harvest. We're told there's three main portions. There's the kernel, which is the part we want, that we eat, that we make something out of. There's the straw, which has a number of uses. And then there's the chaff, which is the husk, which is the lightweight part. And it serves no useful purpose to us and blows away very easily. And uh, it's interesting what some of the rabbinical scholars have to say about the ungodly and blowing away. But we, we're saying here the ungodly are like the lightweight, useless portion of humanity which are easily moved by changes, easily moved by the wind. In fact, some of you perhaps have seen the type of, of threshing that is done even today in many parts of the world where they don't have the kind of machinery and equipment that does it that we do, but uh, where you, you take the grain, you put it out on a hard surface, they run animals or wheels over it to try to break it up and separate it, and then you toss it with a fork. And the reason that a threshing floor, you know, you might think of a threshing floor as uh, to me, a threshing floor always sounded like kind of a down-in kind of place. But it's actually an up-out kind of place. Because you want it where the wind blows freely through it. Which is why the Temple Mount in Jerusalem was originally a threshing floor. I think that's a strange combination. But that when you want the wind to be blowing, you want to be on the hill. And on top of the hill. So we take our fork and we, we toss all of this in the air. And the wind comes through and blows away the useless part. And what keeps falling is the part that we want. He says, the ungodly have chosen to be the useless part, which is blown away and removed by these things. And he goes on to give us a more detailed description. He says, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment. They will not be able to stand or withstand. There will be no opportunity for them to stand and proclaim their righteousness in the judgment. You do recognize that a judgment is coming. Yes. That we are going to have to give some kind of an account here. That all of this that we enjoy isn't here without any responsibility attached to it. Are you aware of how much we've been given? Three of you. And you are aware that to whom much has been given, much is required. There's, there's going to be an accounting of some sort. When I, when I started to realize that I was going to have to stand before God, it started to change the way I approached every day of my life. Someday there's going to be an explanation for all of this. Not probably today, maybe not tomorrow, but someday there's going to be an, a need to withstand. And he says the ungodly doesn't have a chance in that moment. The ungodly is not going to stand. The ungodly will find no seat. The sinners find no seat in the congregation of the righteous. In the New Jerusalem, there is no address for them. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. One translation says the way of the ungodly is doomed. I kind of liked that one. The way of the ungodly is doomed. The Lord knoweth or recognizes the way of the righteous. When we walk in righteousness, he says, oh, I I recognize that. I get that. I know what that's about. But the way of the ungodly is doomed. Now let's talk about the ungodly because that's what we encounter here in verse 1. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Well, it's first of all, these first three things that we notice about this man are, are negative things, things he doesn't do. Then we'll talk about what he does do. That's good news, right? But what he doesn't do. And it, it's an interesting thing. Concerning this, Matthew Henry says, The Lord knows that are, that those that are his by name, but we must know them by their character. Let me give you that again. The Lord knows those that are his by name, but we must know them by their character. The character of a good man 
is here given by the rules he chooses to walk by. The character of a good man is here given by the rules he chooses to walk by. We understand, we recognize this blessed person's character by the rules they choose to walk by, right? And we start out not standing in the counsel of, or walking in the counsel of the ungodly. Now the ungodly here, the Hebrew word is rasha, and it, at its root means wrong. The wrong. The ones who don't get it right. Are you, are you here? Generally meaning wicked, ungodly, or guilty. It also has in it the notion of unsettled or tumultuous. Like the seas being tossed to and fro. This is an individual who is wrong. Wrong in their approach, wrong in their thinking, wrong in their choices. It is an individual who is, because of that, full of turmoil, unsteady and unstable. And we make the statement, he, the blessed person, is not going to walk in the counsel, the wisdom, if you will, that is thrown off by those who are wrong, those who are unstable. We've got to be able to identify this. We've got to be able to identify those who, who match that description. I'll give you one more Matthew Henry, and then I'm done with Matthew Henry for a while. But Matthew Henry on this. The word which we translate ungodly signifies such as are unsettled. Aim at no certain end and walk, to no, walk by no certain rule, but are at the command of every lust and at the beck of every temptation. These the good man sees with a bad heart. He does not... With a sad heart. Wait. Let's see if I can get my tongue in order here. He sees with a sad heart. He does not do as they do. He does not take his measures from their principles, nor act according to the advice which they give and take. Are you aware that there are a large group of folks around us who are wrong? I didn't say everybody's wrong, but there's a seemingly growing number of people out there who are wrong. And the more that wrong gets said, the more it sounds kind of right. About roughly 30 years ago, I heard a preacher say, concerning the statement that the blind lead the blind and they all end up in the ditch, he said, today we have so many of the blind leading the blind, they all end up in the ditch and the ditches are so crowded, people think that's where it's at. And that saying marked me then, and many of you have heard me repeat it since then. But 30 years ago I heard that man say that. I think it's perhaps more true today than it was then. But if we're going to be this blessed individual, if we're going to walk in, these, in, this, in this light of this favor, if we're going to enjoy this favored position with God, we're going to do it by choosing life, which means not accepting the counsel, which includes the reasonings and rationalizations of the ungodly, those who have set aside the fear of the Lord. Then he says he doesn't stand in the way of sinners. The word that we're translating sinner is uh, in the Hebrew chata, which comes from, it can mean an offender in the sense of a criminal or a sinner. And it's, at its root, it means to miss. We've come wide of the mark here. And so he doesn't take advice from those that are wrong, and he doesn't stand or put himself in the place of those who miss. These are conscious choices. This isn't a lucky person. This isn't somebody who just happens to have got it right. This is somebody who is aware of what's going on around them and is consciously choosing these things. If we're going to stand like trees, if we're going to grow through seasons of difficulty and through seasons of of abundance, if we're going to grow and be strong, if we're going to bring forth fruit and perform the function that we have been called into the kingdom for, we are going to have to be people who choose to avoid the counsel of the ungodly and who choose not to stand in the way of sinners. There's a way which folks do things which is not the way I do things. There is counsel which is common in the world which is not the counsel I receive. 
If we're going to be this blessed individual, we're going to have to make some of these choices. You say, that sounds hard. People will laugh at me. That's true. You make these choices and some people will laugh at you. But you know, if you turn over a few pages to the book of Proverbs, you discover that wisdom says wisdom will laugh at you too. And if you've got to pick who you want laughing at you, I'd rather have people laughing at me than wisdom laughing at me. Boy, it get quiet over there. Let's try this side for a while. <laughs> if you've got to pick whether people are going to laugh at you or wisdom is going to laugh at you, I'm with, let's have wisdom on my side and people laughing at me. Now, it, it hurts my feelings when people laugh at me, but I know I can survive that. Experience has taught me that I can outlive people laughing at me. Wisdom starts laughing at you and that road ends soon. I've read the book, I know. (laughs) Hello. And it doesn't end well. We're not going to sit in the seat of the scornful. The Hebrew word for scornful is fun. It's lutz. And it literally means to make mouths at. (laughs) Hence, to scoff. It's just... (laughs) And we're looking at something of a progression here. The ungodly are described by rabbinical teachers as those who have cast off the fear of God. They've put aside the awe of God. A bad choice, but it's not as bad as what it will lead to. Those who cast off the fear of God. Now, a I've been talking about the Proverbs. I'm going to take a quick trip back to the Proverbs for a moment. In Proverbs chapter 16, it tells us something about those who will cast off the fear of the Lord. It says at verse 6 of Proverbs chapter 16, By mercy and truth iniquity is purged. That is, by the chesed, the, the, the tender mercy of the Lord, and by truth, iniquity is purged. If you want to deal with sin, it's dealt with by the covenant love and truth of the Lord. There is no successful cover-up where sin is concerned. And when we try to cover our sins, we bind ourselves to that failure. Let me say that again. When we, when we try to cover our sins, we bind ourselves to that failure. We have to receive forgiveness. And forgiveness comes through mercy and truth, not through a cover-up. Anybody ever tempted to cover up? Four of you. I'm tempted a lot. It's like almost always the first thing that occurs to me when I find myself in something embarrassing is no one else needs to know. I start looking around to see who's in on this before we've... How many we're going to have to kill to to make the cover-up work? (laughs) Hello. But covering doesn't succeed. Have you read the stories of the people in here, the ones who try to cover? Does it work for them? Does everything get hidden and never come back to bother them? No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way in the earth. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. But by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. Our departing from evil is connected to the awe of God. To the extent that we have the awe of God, we find ourselves turned from evil. And if we turn toward evil, it's only because we've lost our awe for God. And it isn't because He's less awesome. It isn't because He's less awesome. When I lose my awe for God, it isn't time for Him to do something wonderful. Come on, God, be more awesome. I'd be more awed if you were more awesome. Do something. Perhaps you know this person. Most folks aren't aren't foolish enough to talk that way about God openly, although they say things which essentially mean that. But we talk that way about people. If I'm not as happy with you as I used to be, change. Maybe I'm the one that's changed. Maybe I'm the one with an attitude that needs some adjusting here. Maybe it's not your performance that's the problem. Are we here? Well, with people, it's hard to tell. Because you could be wrong, they could be wrong, you could both be wrong. 
With God, it's easy to tell. He hasn't changed. He isn't wrong. And His awesomeness hasn't faded a little bit. Looking for a new God. You're not what you used to be. Hello? His awesomeness hasn't faded. If I'm not as awed as I was, the problem is with John. If I'm not as awed as I was, the problem is with John. And if the problem is with John, and the fear of the Lord is what causes me to depart from evil, one of the symptoms I'm going to notice is that John doesn't seem to be repelled by evil. John seems to be okay with evil, a little bit of evil. Oh, it's not really evil. And the more okay John is, the lower his awe has gone. Because you can't stand in awe of God. You can't see what we're talking about when we're talking about God and still harbor a soft spot for evil. But I do so enjoy. Are you still here? Now, in, we're talking about the fear, the awe of God. Back in chapter 8 of Proverbs here, he, uh, he says to us in verse 13, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride, arrogancy, and the evil way in the forward mouth do I hate. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. One of the ways our awe for God shows up is in hatred for evil. It doesn't just help us to depart from, it, from evil. It causes us to hate evil. I say, I don't know if I've ever hated evil. Well, it's time to see God big. It's, it's time to understand who we're talking about here. This is God. You can con me, but you can't con God. You don't fool with God. You don't play those games. This is God we're talking about. And the fear of the Lord is to depart from evil, to, is to hate evil. Are you still here? And chapter 9, just a couple more of these. In, in chapter 9, he says to us at verse 10, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. The beginning place of wisdom. Does anybody want to be wise? Yes. Got a bunch of wise guys here? Yes. I want to be wise. I'm unashamed to admit, I want to be wise. It's not like a wouldn't it be nice if. There's a lot of wouldn't it be nice ifs in my life, but I want to be wise. I'm willing to do something about wise. Are you still here? Wise matters, and the beginning place of wisdom is the awe of God. If we have no awe of God, then no matter what else we know, no matter what else we learn, we're still fools. No matter what kind of information we gather, no matter what kind of counsel we receive, we're fools if we don't have the awe of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning place and the principal thing of wisdom. And we find a similar statement here in Proverbs chapter 1, where it says to us at verse 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So, I'm going back to Psalm 1. He starts out by not walking in the counsel of the ungodly. And I'm saying the ungodly are described as those who have cast off the fear of God. And as such, they come to be the sinners that we're talking about in the next. They standeth in the way of sinners. When we cast off the fear of God, when we are wrong and walk in our own counsel, we go very quickly from being ungodly to being sinners. And that's described as breaking out in open rebellion against God. What were omissions become commissions. You say, what are you talking about now? Well, you've heard that phrase perhaps batted around, sin of omission, sin of commission. Omission is talking about omits. And what we're saying in essence is, the ungodly are going to be largely those who are wrong in what they don't do. But the sinners become wrong in what they do. Do, do. You can miss the mark of God's purpose in your life by omitting things, but you can also miss the mark by committing things. Can't you? And when we begin to move from ungodly to sinners, we've gone beyond just getting it wrong by what we leave out into adding and taking on things which are wrong, committing things. Problems. Open rebellion against God. Not just casting off His fear, but now against Him. 
and frequently angrily so, in opposition to God, standing against Him. Now, do you begin to see why it would be harmful to this person who wants to be blessed, to this person who's trying to grow and be a strong perennial, a tree in the house of God, the planting of the Lord, why it would be harmful to let the counsel and the way of these sort of people be around you all the time, be in you, and be where you're found. Now, you'll notice he doesn't say that this man is ungodly or a sinner, but he could walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He could stand in the way of the sinner. And when he does... He's, it's difficult to distinguish him from them. Are we still on this? And then, if we go from casting off the fear of God to breaking out in open rebellion against God, what's going to be the next stage? Our hearts become hardened until we're scorners who openly defy all that is sacred, scoff at religion and make a jest of sin. Not just happy to be missing the mark by ourselves. We chastise those who do hit the mark. And openly defy all that is sacred, scoff at religion, and make a jest of sin. Isn't that an interesting phrasing? But we're not that person. Didn't you start out wanting to be this blessed person? Four of you. Didn't you start out wanting to be this blessed person? Wasn't that you we were talking about? Well, that's what we're not going to do, but what are we going to do? I need something to do to fill my time. I have discovered in life it's much easier to know what to do than to know what not to do. Or I shouldn't say to know, because how easy it is to know. is. But the point is, it's, it's easier to get things done by deciding to do something than by deciding, deciding what not to do. If I said to you, go out this afternoon and work really hard at not sinning. Well, that's, that's an interesting... I don't know, what am I, now now we're, we're caught in this quandary all the time. But if I said, go out this afternoon and give to the poor. Well, you're going to know right away whether you're doing that or you're not doing that, right? It isn't going to be any question whether we're getting this done or not. We're going to know whether we're on it or not. And if our mission is to spend the afternoon giving to the poor, then that will probably keep us out of all kinds of trouble. Knowing what to do is a very valuable thing. Because one of the problems that we all have when we're trying not to do something is figuring out how to quit thinking about it. And everybody who was on a diet said, Amen. (laughs) What we need to do is figure out how to quit thinking about it. And in my world, the thing which has been most helpful in quitting thinking about whatever it is I'm trying to stand apart from is get busy with something. Do something. Find something of value, something of eternal value, something which is actually productive, something which is good and praiseworthy, and throw yourself into it. You'd be surprised how little time you have for nonsense when you're busy doing something worthwhile. And if you find yourself plagued with thoughts of nonsense all the time and temptation to turn to foolishness, you probably aren't occupied with something worthwhile. You get a hold of a heavenly calling and chase it with everything in you and you don't have a lot of time for foolishness. So we need to know what is this blessed person doing. And verse 2 tells us, His delight is in the law of the Lord. This is a person who is excited about God's word, not a person who dutifully reads a few verses before they doze off. Not a person who dutifully reads a few verses before they doze off, but a person who actually likes this, who finds this interesting, who finds this to hold their attention, who who not only enjoys it while they're actually reading it, but actually spends a little bit of time thinking about it afterwards. I I remember so vividly, this is quite a while ago now, but I used to, I've been for a long time in the habit of reading a proverb every day. And uh, when I, way back as I first started doing that, I got to the point where it was like a, a magic formula. I've got to read my proverb or I've failed. And, and so I'm just, you know, you know, I'm in, I'm in a hurry. I gotta, it's late. I can't deal with it. 27 verses. Why did this have to be a long one? You know, and, 
and I'm, I'm just banging away at them. And one day as I'm at work, I'm, I'm going about my, my, my job at the, at the plant I was working in at that time, and the, the Lord's speaking to me, and he's talking to me about the proverb. And what he was asking me basically was what I could remember from it. And the answer was nothing. I just, I banged it out, baby. (laughs) I got it done. I did my daily proverb reading. I am wise. (laughs) And he's like, and and, uh, what do you remember from that? It's like, I don't remember anything. Why would I remember anything? I wasn't reading it to remember it or think about it. I have other stuff to do. Are you here? That wasn't the point. Reading a proverb every day isn't so that I can see if I can get it done in three minutes flat. Reading a proverb every day is to set me on a course of what I'm thinking about and what I'm considering and what I'm pondering. If you're going to delight in his law, it isn't just when you're actually reading it, but it's whether it continues to hold your attention when you're not reading it. As you continue to consider it. As you work over and over and over again in your heart and your mind what it is that he's saying to you about that. Why that particular word or phrase has has seemed to stick out this morning, this evening, this afternoon. Why the Spirit seems to be on that one. What is it about that word that has my attention today? What are you trying to say to me, Lord? I don't think that sounds like me, but, but do you think that sounds like me? Are you trying to tell me that I'm more like this person than I think I am? Are you warning me about some situation to come and some preparation I need to make for it? What are you talking to me about here? We need to be that person whose delight is in the law of the Lord, who are actually motivated to to pay attention to what he is saying and to throw ourselves into it. Is that an amen moment? In his law doth he meditate day and night. That's all the time, isn't it? And meditate, as you're going to be aware, is uh, it, we're not talking about, you know, find some awkward posture and, and sit there acting strange. We're, we're, talking about, we're talking about continue to ponder, mull it over. Actually, the word is connected to the word for murmuring. It, it's, it's like muttering, not murmuring against, but just muttering. When you're, when you're saying things softly to yourself. Now, I don't know that it's absolutely mandatory that you actually be making noise when you're doing this. You might be in a situation where that would be an ill-advised thing to do. But it's that where, where a thought is so real to you that you're almost talking out loud to yourself about it is what we're talking about. Where you are considering something in the light of the Spirit's counsel as you roll it over and over and over and say, what have I missed about this? What have I not understood about this? What is this trying to tell me? And then we encounter this description. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. The the Hebrew here for rivers is talking about split, and it's actually, some translations call it streams or rivulets. We're talking about water, which is branching and becoming thorough. Actually, one translation calls it reservoirs of water. We're talking about an abundant water supply. We're not talking about a tree which is hanging out of a river bank, threatening to fall in. We're talking about a tree which is in nice, wet area where there's plenty of water to keep it going. Right? Rivers of water bringeth forth his fruit in his season. You know, one of the most important things in life is that we bring forth fruit. Not just pass the time and be here, but bring forth fruit. There's a reason for being here. There's something we're supposed to be doing. Something we're supposed to be occupying ourselves with. Some kind of fruit we're supposed to carry off. You say, we came into this world with nothing, we'll leave this world with nothing. Well, in the sense of material stuff, you can't carry material stuff off with you. But the scripture is quite the opposite. We're supposed to be laying up treasures in heaven. We can take, the the wood, hay, and the stubble is going to burn, but the gold and the silver and the precious stones travel with me. Now, not gold and silver and precious stones in your jewelry box, but gold and silver and precious stones in in the spiritual sense in 1 Corinthians 3. You understand that there are things. The fruit is what we carry with us. Take some loot when you go. Have fruit. Have fruit which remains. Have fruit which has value. Amen? And this individual, when we make these choices, when we are this person, we not only have an abundant supply of water to keep us going, but we get to bring forth fruit. We become the fruitful individual. 
Sometimes the fruit is choked by all the counsel of the ungodly and the way of the sinners that we're standing in. Sometimes it's difficult to bear fruit when you're putting up with all this nonsense in your world. Sometimes we need to distance ourselves from some of this stuff in order to be able to bear fruit. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now that's the description. That's, do you want things you set your hand to to prosper? You want to be successful in the things God's given you to do? It's less enthusiasm. We're working our way down here. He says this is how it's done. And the conclusion at verse 6 again is, The Lord knows or recognizes the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let me read to you Psalm 1 from the Amplified Version of the Bible. He says, Blessed, happy, fortunate, prosperous, and enviable is the man who walks and lives not in the counsel of the ungodly, following their advice, their plans, and purposes, nor stands submissive and inactive in the path where sinners walk, nor sits down to relax and rest where the scornful and the mockers gather. But his delight and desire are in the law of the Lord. And in his law, the precepts, the instructions, the teachings of God, he habitually meditates, ponders and studies by day and by night. And he shall be like a tree, firmly planted and tended by the streams of water, ready to bring forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not fade or wither, and everything he does shall prosper and come to maturity. I like that phrasing particularly, and come to maturity. The things that we engage in come to maturity. Not so the wicked. Those disobedient and living without God are not so. But they are like the chaff, worthless, dead, without substance which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked, those disobedient and living without God, shall not stand justified in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, those who are upright and in right standing with God. For the Lord...